Self-service analytics, it's a myth, a hoax. It's just that holy grail we're all searching for. That's the vibe you're going to get if you've been in the data world for beyond a few years. You've definitely heard us make the argument. In fact, Shakar has a great poll up where he actually shows that most people that responded to him said that no, uh, self-service analytics does not exist. And Shakar was a data leader at many big data companies like Facebook. And so even he and his network are finding that self-service analytics, at the very least, is hard. In fact, when I first entered the data world, uh, Tableau, or kind of the company touting self-service analytics, had been bought out by Salesforce for about $16 billion. And here we are a decade later, still chasing that dragon, right? We were still trying to find it. In fact, in many cases, I feel like the, the narrative is starting to shift that either dashboards are dead or they were never that helpful or they're not what people wanted, right? Because that was really what self-service kind of meant back then. Like take out AI, what was it really? Well, it's dashboard with a bunch of filters. And I'm sure someone out there is gonna say, no, that's not what it was. But like, that's what a lot of what Tableau was selling. Of course, if you say self-service doesn't exist in the wrong room, people will definitely jump on you. So I do want to discuss self-service analytics, kind of maybe where that line is, where's the truth, where's the fiction in this space, how you can actually start pushing towards something that at least looks like it, and maybe discuss a little bit about, you know, AI and how that's changing some of this. All right, to start with, let's talk about the inconvenient truths of self-service analytics. The first one being that it's been a decade. It's been a decade. Shouldn't all the companies that have been trying to implement self-service analytics already have it, right? Like that should be the truth, right? If we've been trying to build something for 10 years, if we've had the tool or at least multiple tools that said, we are the tool that let you do that. And here we are a decade later, we don't have that. What does that mean, right? Like we have to be honest about that. Two, dashboard fatigue is real. Many companies have thousands and thousands of dashboards and most are not looked at. At Facebook, we had like this cleaning tool that would like, initially it was just like cleaning tables, like vacuuming up tables. Uh, I don't remember what it was called. It was just basically a bot that would go through and be like, hey, no one's using these tables. I'm going to like deprecate them. We put that through for dashboards and like 90% of dashboards disappeared very, very quickly. Another thing that's important to understand is executives don't want dashboard homework, right? If you work with people, uh, once you start working at that CEO level, CFO level, CTO level, what you start quickly figuring out is they don't always want a dashboard. Some do, some like filtering and, and cutting and pasting and moving data. Yes, most kind of just want the information, right? Like they kind of want it already distilled. They're looking for a few key facts. And on top of those key facts, they want information. And I've had conversations with this, like uh, I had a marketing leader conversation not too long ago where they're like, hey, we want these numbers, but we also kind of want someone to tell us, you know, what's driving it, what's uh, pushing it. And some uh, AI dashboard companies in my comments right now being like, oh my gosh, that's what my uh, tool does. I'm sure, I'm sure of it. And, and maybe we'll get there. Sadly, I didn't get a sponsor for this video. I should have gotten some new uh, dashboarding tool that does that to sponsor it, but I did not. Honestly, sometimes the pursuit of self-service analytics is the problem itself, right? Some companies just need a basic dashboard or a basic number, but we're so focused on trying to give people all these options that that destroys our ability to deliver, right? It's like being data-driven. Sometimes you're so focused on being data-driven, you miss the point. And I think that's something that happens with a lot of self-service analytics projects. It's like we keep trying to fine-tune it to be perfect in our mind, what we think self-service is, and it just never gets there. The next point is the numbers are still hard to find. Um, I still talk to people who have all these dashboards and they're like, I have to go to five or six to actually find it, which I think is more around how you build your dashboards and like trying to build the thing that the individual needs. And that's something that I, I can see in the future existing is is more personalized dashboards so if, if a tool in my mind instead of having to build 10 different dashboards for five different people if i could just go to a place and be like as the head of marketing this is what i get to see and then maybe as a uh, maybe a lower level person i already get to see what i need to see and the right points get highlighted these are the things that i think in a dashboard and self-service analytics that's where i think things should go personally. And of course, at the end of the day, Excel is still king. It is the king of the last mile analytic problem, right? Like that is the thing that solves all of them. They will always want to put it out to Excel. It always kind of finishes most analysis anyways, because people want to dig into data. Even if we were to give them this highlighted information where this is where a lot of uh, kind of dashboarding solutions are going, where they're like, hey, here's three interesting points, or here's the three things that drove this new peak sales or what's driving churn, etc. Even if we had that, like, oh, here's a highlight of what it was, people would still want to dig into it further, right? Like they're going to want to be like, oh, well, let me get another data set. You know, I need 
more to make a decision, right? Which is more around how people make decisions and less about the data itself. Now, getting past those like inconvenient truths and just the realities that like here we are a decade later, we haven't found a good process. I think some people have, obviously some companies have. It always feels like it's some other company. Like whenever I work with someone, they're like, oh, we had it at a different company and then they, it was beautiful, it was wonderful, but it kind of starts feeling a little bit, again, holy grail-ish. I'm not saying I haven't built things that have allowed people to find the information that they need, but I think there is this aspect of defining what and what you actually mean by self-service analytics first. Okay, so the next point that I wanted to cover is AI, right? Because obviously AI is going to fix it all this time, right? Like this is the solution. The other stuff was not the solution. This is the solution. So far, personally, I've seen a lot of tools and some do a great job of speeding up workflows, highlighting anomalies, which honestly shouldn't have been that hard, but it is. I say that because one of the fraud detection models that I, I worked on, that's all it did is it just highlighted um, upcoding, so medical fraud tendencies of certain providers. And just not that long ago, guess what? United Health got called out for upcoding because people who tend to upcode, upcode a lot, a lot more than other people. It's not a complex model. You just look for anomalies and, you know, had the US government and Medicaid done this a decade ago, they would have found it forever ago. But these are genuinely hard things to execute, right? Like it's easy to say, hard to execute. So, you know, again, there's a lot of AI, it exists. One, you still tend to need guardrails, right? You find this out with AI coding, you find this out with like everything. You still need guardrails around everything. You want to make sure people aren't going freely throughout all the data and getting the wrong data or getting data they shouldn't have access to, right? There's a lot of things that can go wrong between A and B. You do tend to need to have some pre-processed data. So data engineers still have to do some level of that. And so there's all these pre-steps in order to get them there. In fact, most AI tools that I've seen have like a semantic model to it, right? Like ThoughtSpot has their semantic layer. So you still need to go through the process of defining it. And I've talked to them and that's what they've said. And maybe they'll correct me and I'll, I'll cut this part out if, they, if that's incorrect, but that's what they've said. We still have the semantic model and we have to go through it. And so you still have this pre-processing that needs to happen. And then on the other side, so this is like the technical side, on the other side, on the business side, you need people that are good at prompting. And a lot of people are bad. I've talked to a few people who are trying to do this, like, you know, text to insights, text to dashboard ideas. And what they often find is that most people only put a few words in give me data, find me data, tell me more about marketing data, right? Like very short, brief things, because they just want to figure out their information. And it's always that joke, can you just pull this quick data on sales, you know, no context whatsoever. And in fact, in most of these cases, what they end up having to do is essentially ask follow up questions, which to me is comical, because it almost feels very similar to filters, right? Like they have to be like, okay, from the sales data, what are you looking for, right? Like, how do you want to filter it? Is it by region? Is there, you know, they have to kind of do this prompting. And in all fairness, I think there will be this building block where, you know, again, it kind of goes to that, like if we could hyper personalize analytics for each individual, I think that could be something in the future, right? You don't have to keep doing it every time. You kind of know what the person means eventually, maybe when they say sales data, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But, you know, again, executives don't want to go through the whole process every time. And so it will have to take some work in like figuring out what people need. And that's still a challenge. You know, the technical side is hard and the, the business side dealing with business people is hard. All right, so let's talk about a practical guide that into trying to build tools that drive action because that's really what you're trying to do, right? You are trying to do with self-service analytics. What you want to do is build things that people can look at and be like, oh, this is how I can start making decisions, right? And that's really the goal. Step one, and I say step one because this is so important. Don't let vendors define what, what self-service is for you because um, they will, they will. If you do not define clearly, this is what we mean by self-service. This is how we want our business and non-technical users to interact with the data. You will have a vendor sell you on their idea of it because every vendor has their own idea, right? One person is filtered. One person is a search bar, whatever. Be very, very clear how you want it to be, like what you think it should be. You, you might not have the perfect answer, but at least some principles that you can point back to and be like, ah, oh, this tool does match those principles. We can work with that because no tool is perfect. I want to be clear. Every tool has some suck factor to it, but you have to be very clear. Otherwise you'll buy whatever tool someone sells you to develop for, for action, right? You got to develop for things that actually drive action, which means you have to understand what action is trying to drive, right? I know that sounds profound. It's not. It just means, right? Like when you build that dashboard, what is it actually going to do? The question I generally ask here is, if this number goes up by 10%, if it goes down by 20%, if it, you know, if you see it cut by 50%, what would you do? Like, what is the response? Is there a response or is it just like fire and you have no idea, right? Is this just meant to be, you know, so that the end user has a better framing when they go into a board meeting? Is this meant to, again, change marketing spend? What is this meant to do? 
So be very clear on developing a bias for action when you build data products, data dashboards, etc. Except that to a degree, self-service is a spectrum, both because of users and because of the tools and, and how you build different solutions. On one side, it might just be you manually pulling ad hoc data or pulling out and building charts and running your own analysis, right? That's very centralized, very much you're doing everything. On the other side, you could imagine a world where there's this perfect semantic layer. You can go to it. You can ask it questions. Metrics are predefined. You know, it's a central metric layer of some kind. The BI tool allows people to save and create their own personalized dashboards to a degree or, or it just personalizes it for them. I think that would be the perfect world. And the data team is really focused on, you know, the performance, the capabilities, the reliability of the data, right? Like you're, you're really more managing the product and less having to do all this other stuff. And that's this, this perfect world, right? Like it's decentralized and users can just come, they can build their own thing that they need and then they leave. Next, understand why and who you're building for. And I kind of talked about this a little bit in terms of developing for action, but also, you know, you're developing a product for an end user, right? You should really treat it that way. This is for the marketing team, right? The marketing team is trying to drive what business outcomes, right? Again, they're trying to do better on their spend. They're trying to figure out where attribution is great, even though that's a very challenging problem, like where attribution actually makes sense. So they know how to invest next quarter. You need to have very clear kind of use cases for this dashboard. It shouldn't just be, hey, I have a whim. I'm trying to build this dashboard because I, I, I'm curious about it. I actually have a, a whole um, article called Stop Shipping Dashboards That Don't Matter. You should check that out. I'll leave it in the comments because I think it's a great article. And if you are not signed up for my newsletter, please join. And then the next thing I think is like, it, it, there is this aspect of like building a good culture around asking questions and doing more than just, again, going to a dashboard and assuming that's where the answer will always be. You kind of have to teach the users to, to ask these better questions, right? Like as you give them a dashboard, as you're going them through the process of teaching them to use it, you're kind of teaching them the questions that you would ask if you were in their position, right? Like maybe you don't have all the business knowledge, right? But you've got some of it. Help them kind of see like, hey, these are the questions I would have, right? Like, hey, is this new policy that's coming in from the US government going to change how people buy products, right? These are the things that they're going to likely ask. And then that needs to kind of be somehow answered in your in your dashboard, right? You can't answer all the problems, but at least, right, like you want to be able to answer these things. And part of that is by teaching them to ask better questions, because if they ask better questions, you know how to deliver for them. Again, otherwise, you just get these like five word requests where it's like, I need sales data from last year or something. And that's such a broad question that most of us are gonna be like, I don't know uh, what that means, right? Like, what are you actually asking of me? Look, there's a lot of truths and, and fictions, I think, in self-service analytics, right? One, self-service analytics was a term and is still a term that was used to sell dashboards, right? Like dashboarding tools. That That's really at its core, right? If you look a decade ago, especially before AI, that's what it was used for, for being honest. It's not to say that you can't get somewhere close. It's not to say that there isn't somewhere in the spectrum that your team might actually be able to deliver. And if you have a business side that loves looking at dashboards, great. But I'll be honest, I, every once in a while, I'll make comments about self-service analytics and someone underneath will, will comment. You assume people, you know, the, the business users want to go to dashboards. Some business users don't, right? You'll build them a dashboard and they don't actually want to look at it. They always just wanted the answer and maybe they just want that answer once or maybe they want that answer provided for them. But everyone has different levels of like how much they actually want to get involved. And so you won't always be in a perfect situation where everything you want to exist or everything that you, you know, how you want that self-service to exist uh, won't always be the way that will be ideal for your current situation, right? You can wish your, your business side was different, but they are not. And so you have to also be honest in that regard, right? And you have to build them what best serves them. So I do think there's this aspect of understanding your user and it takes time and helping them understand how to ask better questions, asking them good questions. I have a video plan on that about what you should ask your business team and it'll help you kind of phrase them and frame them so you're actually running better questions. So watch out for that video. And then I'm planning another series where I'm going to do like 100 days of like a data team. I want to go through as much as I can for everything in the data team, like data analytics, data engineering. Um, it'd probably be more than 100 days. It's just a challenge for myself because I'm so bad at doing series that I'm like, I want to do a series where I actually complete it. We'll see if I do it this time. Fingers crossed. With that, guys, I want to say thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see y'all next time. Thanks all. Goodbye. <laughs>